So thank you very much for having me. Um, it's always fun to talk about some really weird places in the world that you may have never been and that I never thought I'd go. Um, the point of giving this talk this time of year was <clears throat> that by this time of the year, a lot of people are sick of winter. So why don't we think about somewhere that never sees winter and is always warm? Um, but you know, this winter hasn't super delivered. <laughs> so anyways, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about a really, really interesting place um, in the world that I got to do a lot of my PhD field work, um, the Peruvian Guano Islands. And so who here has ever been to Peru? Anyone? Who's seen Peruvian boobies in the wild? OK, so we have some people that are going to be familiar with what I'm talking about, but a lot that aren't, which is great. Um, so like Sarah said, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder. I've been there for about two years. And um, <clears throat> I study birds, predominantly birds that hybridize. Uh, but tonight, what I'm going to talk about more is this really cool place that I got to go when I was doing my field work uh, that was really foreign for someone who grew up in southern Ontario. Uh, like Sarah said, I'm Canadian, so I'm used to forests and water um, and not this kind of landscape. So a really, really interesting place to be. So I'm going to talk a bit about why I was there and what I was doing and what a typical day was like. And then I'm going to get into uh, why this is such an incredible part of the world. So. The coast of Peru is interesting for a lot of reasons, and we'll get into why that is from an ecological perspective, which I think is what a lot of you are interested in, so ecology and wildlife and so on. But these islands were also really important economically, and I think that that plays a really in interesting role in why the islands have been um, accessed by humans as far back as Inca, uh, the Inca. <clears throat> and so we'll talk about that as well, and I'll give you a bit of a timeline on this guano extraction, but just so that everyone's on the same page. Um, this is what guano is. I mean, we're familiar with it. It's probably been on our cars, maybe on us, which is considered good luck, in which case I am a very lucky human because I have been defecated on by hundreds, if not thousands of birds. Um, but guano is the excrement of seabirds and bats. So we often think about guano deposits in caves. Guano deposits are also really important uh, in a lot of seabird colonies, particularly ones that don't get a lot of rain. So we're going to get into this, but the coast of Peru is a place that gets almost no rain, and the guano deposits there are pretty, pretty incredible. There are also some really important guano deposits in the United States, uh, down off the coast of Florida. But guano is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, the main one is that for a long time, we couldn't produce our own fertilizer. We didn't have the Haber-Bosch process until the mid-20th century. And so prior to that, natural sources of nitrogen were what we used both for fertilizer production and for gunpowder production, actually. Um, and so guano was an important source of natural nitrogen for those two commodities. And the name comes from a Quechua name uh, for the exact same thing, guano, which we changed into guano. So we're all on the same page. Um, <clears throat> this is a typical Peruvian guano island. And I know it looks like a sandy island that would be really amazing to spend some time on. But it is not sand. Everything you're looking at there that is covering that island, other than birds, which these are Peruvian boobies, we'll talk more about them later, is guano. So this is all dried up guano. I'll try not to swear during the talk because we are being, <laughs> but you know, you tend to go to that language. At any rate, this is a, covered in a lot of guano. Um, and to the point where if you're climbing up these uh, hills here, you can be up to your knees in what looks and feels like sand, but is dried out guano. So when you wake up in the morning, when you're staying on these islands like I was, your eyes are often crusted shut. Um, I don't even know what was going on in my lungs at the time, but I'm sure if I went back, I'd probably have some kind of respirator. At any rate, <laughs> really, really interesting islands. I lived on this one for about four months, but we'll get into that. I just want to set the stage. So these islands are amazing because they literally are covered in guano. Um, historically, they were covered in meters and meters of this stuff, but most of it's been extracted, and we'll get into that as well. So if you zoom in on this, the guano birds, which I'll talk about, which include Peruvian boobies, Peruvian pelicans, and guanai cormorants, they tend to use guano to make nests because there's really nothing else there to make nests with. And so these are Peruvian booby nests. As they defecate, they just wipe their butt in a circle. And eventually, you get a booby-sized nest of guano that builds up over time. Um, they'll reuse these nests, and they grow through time. But if you were to break one up and, and harvest it, it actually is quite a bit, probably one to two kilograms of guano for that species. 
Uh, and this is what it looks like when the guano is being harvested. So back in the background here, these are guanai cormorants, and I'll talk more about those later. They're among the most densely nesting birds in the world at three to four nests per meter squared. A meter is about the same as a yard, I think. Um, and then this is all guano that's being scraped off of the island to be removed in bags for, like I said, fertilizer, and not really anymore for gunpowder production. But just to get the scale, so these bags are probably, you know, up to my knee or so. This is all accumulated guano with bags at the bottom and the top. So this stuff can really, really build up quickly. And we'll talk about why that is as we, as we go through. And for anyone, if you have any questions as we talk, this is a really weird part of the world that often brings up questions. Uh, just feel free to ask. And there'll be time at the end as well. So <clears throat> when I went to these islands, I was a little bit younger. It was about 10 years ago, I guess, almost exactly. Um, and I had spent most of my time in, in Canada, in the temperate forests of Ontario, where there's water and trees and a complex ecosystem and food web. And so I was really kind of shocked when I first reached these islands. I had read about them, but I became really, really fascinated by them. So what I'm going to first talk about is my travels, what it was like there. How do you get to a guano island? And then actually, how do you get on to a guano island? It's not as easy as you might think, or maybe you didn't expect it to be easy. Um, then we'll talk about the Humboldt Current, which is this amazing current off the coast of South America that is the reason why these guano islands exist, at least why they're covered in guano. Um, we'll talk a bit about guano island ecology, and then I think the thing that I hadn't realized when I first got there and was working on these islands was how important guano was to the history of this region. So during the heyday of the guano era, this was like a multi-billion dollar industry that actually allowed Peru to be a really stable, economically stable country in a time when most South American countries were not. So we'll get into that later as well. So this is a flashback for me. Um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time wandering around these islands and thinking about food webs and, and also the research I was doing. And I'll tell you a bit more about that at the end um, and as we go through my time here. But this was a, a common scene for me wandering among boobies and pelicans and even penguins on some of the islands, thinking about how did I get myself here? Am I going to get home? Uh, and you'll see why I was thinking that. But for a very poorly traveled individual at this point in my life, um, it was a really, really interesting experience. And it looks kind of nice, right? Like there's a beach you could hang out on. Maybe you could go swimming. But you have to remember, the water is about 10 degrees Celsius. So uh, what is that in Fahrenheit? 40 something? You're not really going to want to spend a lot of time in it, sort of Alpine Lake-like. Um, and although the beaches look nice, these islands are also covered in ectoparasites. And we're going to talk about that more. But when you get a lot of organisms in one place, like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of birds, you also get lots of ticks. Uh, they're different than the ticks we experience here. You can squish them, but it hurts when they bite you. They're very annoying. Um, and I'll tell you more about them later. So it wasn't the situation where I could just go lounge on the beach for a month while I was collecting data. Uh, you really. That would not be a good thing to do on these islands. <clears throat> so these stars indicate the places that I was fortunate enough to travel as a PhD student. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to detail my trip in Peru in 2007, but I the next year went down farther south, sampling birds along the coast of Chile as well. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to do is just walk through this trip. Again, this was the first time I traveled really broadly. Um, I've done a lot more traveling since then to the Arctic and Antarctica, the Galapagos, and other places. So I'm a much more seasoned traveler now, <laughs> but back then I was consistently thinking about whether or not I was actually going to get home. Um, <clears throat> so zooming in then to the coast of Peru, and we're going to get into kind of what it's like here as we go in terms of the environment and the things you might see, but I landed in Lima, Peru, which is between these two stars here. We first went south and then went north, and so I'm going to detail that for you. Again, this was already 11 years ago, which is crazy how the time flies, but now I have my own lab, and some of my own students might be going back here in the coming years, which, after seeing this talk, they're, you know, <laughs> ca cautiously excited about. So we landed in Lima um, prior to the, you know, prior to going out to the Nini Islands, and we first went south to Pisco, Peru, which is a place that, if you've been to Peru to go birding on the coast, is a, somewhere you might have been. We got there very shortly after a very large earthquake, so 
a lot of facilities were down and a lot of people were unfortunately living in tents. Um, so it was an interesting introduction to an already relatively harsh place to be. Uh, it's a coastal desert, this entire area, which again is not familiar to me. But when you get to the coast, it's very, very full of life. And we're gonna talk about this cool juxtaposition of extremely dry desert next to one of the richest currents in the world a little bit later on. But to get to the first island, we got on this amazing little powerboat with two outboard motors and uh, went out to the island that we were supposed to get onto. This is Chincha Island Centro, so Isla Chincha Centro, the central Chinchas Island. Um, but what do you not see there in terms of an ability to get onto the island? There's no longer a pier. <laughs> Um, so we didn't know that until we got there, and we only had permits to visit this island, but um, luckily I had a very smooth-talking colleague from Peru who then got us onto this island. So this is uh, the North Chinches Island in Peru. It's not one that's visited by anyone but scientists, and um, each island actually has a guard that lives on it, and the guards have been there for a while now. They keep fishermen off of the islands, uh, historically and contemporarily, fishermen <coughs> in coastal Peru will spend two to three weeks out at sea. And so they go to the islands for safe harbor in the evening. They often like to go onto the islands to play soccer um, or just to sit on land for a little while, but um, they will also take eggs and disturb the birds. So each, each island has a guard who's armed and often spends two to three months alone. So they're very talkative when you get there. Um, <laughs> the guard that I bonded with the most, I'll introduce you to later, but he was a pretty amazing guy. Now this was an interesting island for it to be the first guano island that I visited because it had this structure here. And what does that look like? It looks like, sorry? A prison. A prison. Yeah, well, <laughs> it was supposed to be a hotel. Uh, <laughs> so they did a bad job. No, um, so <clears throat> historically the government of Peru thought, oh, well, we have all these, like, they're tropical islands, right? It's, it's a nice place to be in some ways. And so they built this, uh, this was supposed to be a resort on the North Chinches Island, and it did not do well, um, given that it is whitewashed because of guano. Also, teeming with ectoparasites, a really cool place for a naturalist to go, but if you don't care about nature, you don't want to be on these islands because they are pretty inhospitable places. It worked well for us, though, because as I'll get into, you don't work during the hottest part of the year, uh, day because you can stress the birds out to the point where they would not recover, and so we would work in the hotel, which is kind of an interesting thing. So this is the first island I went to, easy to get to, it took us 40 minutes. Um, we were out there for a day. We actually did go swimming, even though it was cold. And then these are, these are guanite cormorants. So I think the thing you'll notice from a lot of the images is that the amount of wildlife in this location is overwhelming. I've never been anywhere in the world where there were so many living things around me all the time. It was actually pretty amazing. So in terms of getting onto a guano island, this is a typical scenario. So these were built back during the heyday of the guano industry when large ships would come to the islands to take those bags of guano back to the mainland or to North America or even to Europe. Um, so can you see how you might get on the island from a boat, keeping in mind that this is a, um, probably 25 meters, so 25 yards, we'll say. Any ideas? Can you pick it out? It's kind of hard to see. So this here, no, this, this doesn't move at all, although that's a good suggestion. That would have been great. Um, <laughs> you can't really see it because of the resolution, but this is a rope ladder. <laughs> Who's ever climbed a rope ladder before? <laughs> is it easy? No. How do you do it? Do you climb it like a ladder? No. You shouldn't, because if you climb it like a ladder, you end up you know, over two meters of swell in a very, very cold ocean with all your expensive equipment on your back. <laughs> So you actually climb a rope ladder by the side. So you go up in a way that, I, so this was the first rope ladder I ever climbed, we'll say that. Um, so, you know, you get on the rope ladder and then the boat disappears because it's about two meters of swell. And then you're just left swinging in the breeze as you climb up. And I do have a fear of heights. So it was a challenge, <laughs> a challenge to say the least. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, you know, it's, these are the kind of stories that are fun to recount when you're not experiencing them, I think. Um, <laughs> But two weeks after I left this island, another researcher actually fell from here into the boat and shattered her pelvis. And the evac time um, to get to an actual hospital is about 36 hours. So it, it can be a dangerous place to work. I got very lucky, I was never hurt, but 
certainly when I showed pictures like this to my advisor when I got home, <laughs> she was like, where did I send you? <laughs> what? <laughs> But it was all fine. They also they lower a hook down that you put all of your equipment for collecting bird blood on, which was what I was predominantly doing, taking blood samples from birds, which I'll show you. So they're not easy to get onto. These islands are mostly really, really steep, rocky outcrops. There are some that have beaches, but predominantly they don't. And this was the goal. So these are what I think are perhaps the classiest of the boobies, if a, if a booby can be classy, which I think they can. So these are Peruvian boobies or Sula variegata. They are the only species of booby that lives in cold water regions, so they're endemic to the Humboldt Current upwelling system. Um, it, I'll show you later a better image, but they have wine red colored eyes, really, really beautiful eyes. They don't have colorful feet like, like their sister species, the blue-footed booby, but they look relatively similar overall. So these birds are probably the most numerous of the boobies, although they have this really restricted distribution. There are literally millions of them. Um, and in most ways, has anyone ever seen gannets, northern gannets or cape gannets? So gannets are closely related to boobies. <clears throat> and although all of the other boobies are tropical in distribution, these live in cold water like gannets. And they also nest very, very close together on cliffs, just like gannets. So they're much more gannet-like than a typical booby. And they can also raise five chicks, which for a seabird is unheard of. Most seabirds raise one, like an albatross. Some seabirds raise two, like many of the boobies. <clears throat> but the closest relative of these, the Peruvian booby, so the closest relative is the blue-footed booby. They only ever lay two eggs. And they have what's called facultative siblicide. So a blue-footed booby will always lay two eggs. And if there's lots of food resources, <clears throat> both of the chicks will survive. If food resources are limited, the firstborn will kill the second. And then in the next closest related species of booby, the Nazca and masked boobies, they always lay two eggs, but they have what's called obligate siblicide. So the first to hatch will always kill its sibling. So it's really interesting then that generally boobies only have one or two offspring, and then this species can actually have up to five. <clears throat> and it has everything to do with this amazingly rich current that they live on and forage in. So just to set the stage, and I know that this video is not very good, and I apologize for that, but I only had like a Fujifilm fine picks. I was not a wealthy graduate student, as you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> this kind of sets the stage for what it sounds like in these places. So I'll back it up and play it again after I give you a little bit of info. So boobies vocalize um, quite a lot. The ones that you, you hear kind of grunting and very loud, those are the females. And the males will whistle. And I have a different video I'll show you where you can hear the males. And actually, no one knew for sure that males only whistled and females only grunted until I published my very first scientific paper, which was, how do you tell the sex of a Peruvian booby in the wild? You just have to listen to them. Um, because physically, they're not dimorphic. So in blue-footed boobies, as we'll show you later, you can easily tell if it's a male or female from looking at it. With Peruvian boobies, you can't do that. So anyways, you can see that they nest really, really densely. They tend to nest in flat surfaces or cliffs. Again, this is all guano that they're producing. So the movement of resources from the ocean to the land in this system is really, really incredible. And you know, basically, all of the nutrients in the system come from the ocean. Um, and you can see that there are chicks in these nests, and I'll show you how we sample those later. And keep in mind, that's just one small part of a colony of about 100,000 birds. Is that a natural cliff? No, so this is a water cistern. So all of the islands, there's boats that bring fresh water to them. Um, usually every two or three months, but sometimes every six months, which causes the guard to go into a bit of a panic. But this is a water cistern for the guard. Yeah, that would be a crazy looking natural cliff. I should have said that first, <laughs> sorry. Um, OK, so I spent da time down in the Chinches Islands, and then we went north to Mazorca. Um, this island is much more kind of a lot more relief. So it's quite a steep island. These cliffs were, or these ledges are not natural. They were, were built to provide more surface area for the birds to nest on. Um, <clears throat> to increase guano production. And then typically there are one or a few structures in which the guard lives and which historically would have housed guano harvesters. 
we'll get more into that, but most guano harvesters were actually indentured servants. Um, you can see that this, this is actually a larger distance rope ladder than the last one, but I was old hat at it by then, so I did not fall into the ocean. Interestingly, um, <clears throat> this part of the world, who's ever seen a Franklin's gull? Some people, so Franklin's gulls, they nest in, in North America, but the entire population actually winters off the coast of Peru. And there was a flock of, they think around 500,000 around this island when we were there, which was really cool. Um, so here's another short video. And this one, you can hear the male Peruvian boobies whistling. So even though Peruvian boobies are closely related to blue-footed boobies, which are known for their very charismatic display of waving their feet and dancing around and whistling, Peruvian boobies do all of that, but on a much kind of reduced scale, as if you give them some kind of maybe Valium or something. Um, <laughs> I don't have any pictures of their display, but you can imagine that if you're living in a really dense colony like this and you start dancing around with your feet and you get too close to your neighbor, they're going to bite you. And so I think the, the density at which these nest has really influenced the elaborateness of their displays. This is out the window of the kitchen. So there you could hear some whistles. Those are the males. The end of their display, they throw their head up and they whistle at the females. Um, and then all of this, this entire white blur, is nesting Peruvian boobies, as well as down here. So on this island, again, tens of thousands of birds were nesting uh, when we were visiting. And interestingly, you're going to see in a lot of pictures, there's a lot of areas where there are not birds nesting. Historically, that would not have been the case. Um, these birds were actually their population size was limited not by food resources, as you might expect, but by places to nest, which is pretty amazing. And we'll get into kind of the history of their populations once I have finished talking about the trip. So we went to that island, and I didn't say this, but to get to that island, we were on a relatively shoddy boat. The coastal fisheries here are really, really poor, unless they're uh, large anchovy boats or um, that usually work for fish meal companies. The, the, the locals don't have tons of money, and so their boats are not, not that great. But it only took us about three hours to get out here, and we were there and back in a day. And this is all relevant because the last island I went to took a really long time to get to. So from here, we went north all the way to northern Peru. Um, and that highway that goes from Lima all the way to northern Peru is really interesting. If you look to your left as you're driving north, you see sand all the way down to the ocean, hundreds of meters below. And if you look to your right, you just see sand dunes as far, as far as you can see. They have to plow the road for sand in this area. And it's a pretty interesting highway to be on. But the nicest bus I've ever actually been in was the bus we took from Lima to northern Peru. So once we get up there, this whole part of the coastline is actually sandy, so you can't launch boats from this region. And the, the closest harbor is up here in Sechura. And these are the two islands that we wanted to go to. So a large part of my thesis, which I'll tell you about later a little bit, was looking at interactions between Peruvian boobies, which I've shown you, and blue-footed boobies, which actually are distributed farther north and are known for being in the Galapagos, being in the Gulf of, um, well, being in the Sea of Cortez and the coast of Mexico. These are the only two islands in the world where you find both. So on both of these islands, you can find Peruvian boobies, you can find blue-footed boobies, and they actually sometimes make mistakes and breed with one another and produce hybrids, which is a huge focus of my research. <clears throat> to get to these islands, you have to take a boat from here to this island. You have to arrive in the morning, because at least at the time that we were going there, the lighthouse was broken. So if you arrived at night, you wouldn't see the island, and you would sink, which would be bad. <laughs> so you arrive here in the morning, you wait out the day, and then you leave at night to arrive here in the morning as well, because also the lighthouse was broken there too. <laughs> um, so we arrived in Sechura, Peru. This is a really typical coastal town in northern Peru. Um, very few trees, very dry desert, but where rivers come down out of the Andes, there's lots of vegetation. You can see flamingos. You can see a lot of other things. These are predominantly black vultures. So a really interesting and dry place. When we got there, we found out that the engine on the boat we were going to Hegel to use was actually broken. So we had to wait even later into the night to leave. 
And then we got on the boat to go for 14 hours. It's not a long distance, but it's not a fast boat. So, <laughs> and you're going, the predominant current here and wind is from the south. So you're going against the current and against the wind, so it takes you longer um, in order to arrive here in the morning. And so this is the boat. Um, I look a lot younger there. I look like I don't know what I've gotten myself into, perhaps. This is my collaborator, Carlos Zavalaga. He's an amazing Peruvian seabird scientist who I still collaborate with. I could lie down across this boat and touch both sides. Um, this is the exhaust from the car engine that drives the boat, which is very, very loud. Um, and then the boat is an active fishing boat, so we're going out with fishermen that we've negotiated with to take us to this island and then pick us up. And um, these are not new nets. They are very well-used nets. So it's a very marine experience when you're on this boat with respect to the smells um, and so on. So I was a little bit you know, concerned with whether we were going to make it. There's no navigation system on these boats. They use the stars, which is amazing, but for someone of my generation, worrisome. Um, and I, I'll talk about the stars more later. The most amazing stars I've ever seen in my life down there. Um, but they said, oh, just, just go to sleep, and you'll wake up, and we'll be there. I thought, OK, we'll see what I can do. So this is our life raft. It's made of balsa wood. Um, <laughs> And it's really, you know, it's very different for us, right? We don't think of life raft as literally being trees strung together. But if you think about where we were in the world, this is a really, really rare resource, right? To have trees, um, they have to get them from up in the mountains. So they really value these life rafts. Although, from my perspective, it was good that I had this, which was my life jacket. The only one with a life jacket was me. Although I would have gotten hypothermia anyways had I been in the water for very long. So. And the boat is just, they steer it with a rudder. Someone's up all night doing that. So my friend Carlos and collaborator, he has been doing this since he was a kid. So he just fell asleep. He also snores extremely loudly. <laughs> so he was basically already asleep at this point, And I was just thinking, ooh, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> but um, we got around the corner. So if you remember, we had to come out around the coast and go down to the island. And as soon as we got here, um, Oh, lovely animation. Um, as soon as we got to that point, water started splashing into the boat. It was a little bit choppier than they thought it would be. And I thought, this is pretty unsustainable for me if it's going to be 14 hours of cold water. And so they're like, oh, don't worry. Just wrap yourself up in this tarp. So I was sleeping beside perhaps the loudest snoring human on the planet <laughs> on top of, so our cushion here was just used fishing net, so pretty, pretty fishy. And I was trapping all of that with a non-breathable tarp. So I don't know that I slept. I know that I wasn't fully conscious the whole time. Um, I had to you know, get up and use the bathroom, which required holding onto a wire and leaning out over the Humboldt current, hoping you know, we wouldn't hit a wave or something. The boat was small enough that we were typically um, within swells. So the swells were huge. Um, but when you're in one, you couldn't see the horizon, and then you come out over one. And as long as the waves aren't breaking, it's pretty safe. So I didn't fall out of the boat. I did wake up a few times, or whatever it was, and saw the stars, which were, like I said, it was like being in a planetarium, but it was the planet. It was amazing. Stars to the horizon in every direction. The clearest night skies I maybe have ever seen. And I think those things, looking back on them, although at the time I was like, well, that's really cool. Looking back on it, it was a really, really special experience. So in the morning, we woke up, and I saw this pelican. And I quickly took a picture of it, knowing that if there's a pelican, there's got to be an island. <laughs> we got to be there. <laughs> and we were. And so this is Lobos de Tierra, um, named after the sea lion colonies there. So Lobos is a Spanish word for sea lion. And this is the largest blue-footed booby colony in the world. So when we think of blue-footed boobies, we tend to think of Galapagos. Uh, the populations there are actually declining, whereas this colony is, um, is very, very healthy and very, very large. Probably 200,000 or more blue-footed boobies breed here. And these patches of dark that you can see, those are pelicans. And then remember that back in the day when these bird populations were as high as they uh, used to be, this whole island would have been covered in nesting birds. 
and again, ni nicely whitewashed. And then this is the guard's house. And this was the house where I was instructed to sleep at one point, which I did not do. And I'll tell you why in a minute. So, so what did you notice the most from that video? Wind. Wind. It's very, very windy there. You got to stay hydrated. Now that I live in Colorado, I'm familiar with staying hydrated. I wasn't back then. Uh, there's a really strong, relatively cool breeze, but the sun is really, really intense because you're basically on the equator. So it's an interesting place to do field work. Um, this is a typical blue-footed booby colony, so much more dispersed than Peruvian boobies. These are their nests, so they also are defined by excrement, um, but in a different way than Peruvian boobies, so it doesn't build up. They basically just hoop in lines, and at a really active blue-footed booby nest, it kind of looks like a flower made of guano. Um, the reason that they nest so far apart is because of that display that they do. They fly into their nests with their feet up in front of their chests, they land and dance around and so on. Um, so they're much more dispersed nesters than Peruvian boobies. You could hear them as well. Uh, the blue-footed boobies sound similar, females grunt, males whistle. Um, but again, there's more dimorphism, so there's more differences between males and females than there are for Peruvian boobies. So here you can see uh, both species. So there's a colony sort of of Peruvian boobies here with the white heads, and then surrounding them are blue-footed boobies. Blue-footed boobies have a lot more brown feathers on their heads. They're not as stark white as the Peruvian boobies. And a lot of the work we were doing, other than collecting blood samples, was to attach GPS trackers to figure out where these birds were foraging and whether there were differences in where Peruvian boobies were going versus blue-footed boobies. So, Given that they're so similar, are they using different resources? That was a huge part of why we were out there. Um, but basically, we only spent a day on this island before going to the next one where we stayed for three weeks. And uh, at the end of the day, before the boat was there, I was told to go and sleep in that little shack I showed you. And I thought, OK, I'm tired. <laughs> I was just in a boat for 14 hours, and I laid down um, and then felt like something was watching me after a few minutes and opened up my eyes and looked across the We'll call it a pillow, it was just my shirt. And there were six or seven of these ticks about the size of my thumbnail, slowly feeling their way towards my face. And I quickly got up and just went down to the dock. I was like, I'm gonna wait, uh, wait down here, probably not have a nap. So we'll get in more to the ectoparasites later, but they played a big role in my time there. Um, here's a blue-footed booby family. So the chicks are quite fluffy. Both species have really fluffy chicks. And you can see the differences that exist between males and females here. So this individual is a male. You can see that he has a really small pupil. He's also overall quite a bit smaller than the female. She's, although she is closer to you, she's also quite a bit bigger than him. And the really cool thing is it looks like she has a bigger pupil, right? It looks like that dark part of her eye is larger than his. And maybe it's because it looks like he's staring into the sun, but that's actually not the case. So she has pigment surrounding her pupil that makes it look larger than it actually is. And has anyone ever heard of the belladonna hypothesis? This idea that large dilated pupils is an attractive character? I think, and this is an impossible field experiment, it would be really cool to manipulate the size of those pupils to see how they how that changes interactions between mates, because I think it's a sexually selected character. So we know sexual selection is really important in boobies. That's why they have blue feet. So female blue-footed boobies, if, if their male is taken away and starved for 24 hours, um, when he comes back, his feet are a different color. So the color of their feet is a combination of structural collagen, which reflects blue, and they underlay that with carotenoids, so really, which are yellow. A really, really attractive blue-footed booby has aquamarine-colored feet. And I see a few aquamarine-colored shirts out there in the audience. When you starve one for 24 hours, their feet are dark blue. And the female, if she sees that, the next egg she lays is only half the size of the previous one. So she reduces investment in that mate really, really quickly. It's a really dynamic signal. If you do the same to the female and then put her back with the male, he is very less invested, he doesn't display to her as much, and so they're really using the color of their feet as this dynamic signal of quality. 
like, are you okay? Are you going to be able to raise my young? And so on. And so I feel like the eye is playing a role in that too, but it would be really hard to put contacts in a booby, I think. <laughs> Here you can also see this is the GPS device that we were attaching. So we put these on the tails of individuals and then retrieved them after we got back. Each of those at that time was about $2,400. They're much cheaper now. And we only lost one, which is pretty good. OK, so we spent time on Lobos de Tierra, and then we went out to our ultimate destination, Lobos de Fuera, another nine hours. And the richness of the ocean here can really not be overstated. So these are sea lions. I woke up to that. <laughs> the, guard, the boat driver got us really, really close to the colony in the hopes that I would get splashed by one, and I did. <laughs> but it was really cool to see the, the concentrations of marine mammals in this part of the world are higher than anywhere else. And this is just one small example of that. This is the island I ended up uh, living on for three weeks, doing a lot of my work. This is the guard of the island, Nieto, and I'll tell you a little bit about him in a minute. Um, a typical day looked like this, so catch the birds, take their blood. We would usually take the blood from their brachial vein, so just the one that runs over your ulna. You just pierce it and then take a little bit. They don't notice it really. They're quite large, so you're not taking very much blood at all really compared to body size. You only work in the mornings and the evenings, so you spend a lot of days like this, just chilling. Um, and then we would also, when we were attaching tracking devices, we would paint the bellies of the birds so that we could come back to the colony and retrieve those very expensive GPS devices. And if you're wondering how you catch a baby, it's very easy. They're just like loaves of bread. <laughs> you walk up to them and you pick them up. <laughs> then they defecate on you and throw up. And when boobies throw up, it's some semi-digested fish. They shake their heads from side to side. So I've had my fair share of rotting fish in my mouth, hair, face, etc. Um, but the adults are a little harder to catch. And so um, we use this pole, kind of like a cartoon when someone needs to be taken off of stage. But basically, you just get this around the neck of an adult and slowly pull them out of a colony. They're not as afraid of people as you might think. They're not like the Galapagos, where you can walk right up to the boobies. Because people have been accessing these islands for a long time, they are skittish. But you can get pretty close to them, probably from me to the front row of people, which is as long as our pole. So a typical day also involved a lot of new experiences for me. Um, this was one of them. So what are we looking at? Octopus? Uh, that's a good guess. It looks kind of like an octopus's leg arms. Here's its face. It's a moray eel. And so you have to cut them. You have to cut them here because if you don't, they have a tendency to bite or shut their mouths even when they're dead. This stops their muscles from being able to do that. This was a favorite of the guard that we were living on the island with, and he would get these from the fishermen in exchange for allowing them to come onto the island and play soccer, which is pretty awesome. It was a nice flat area for soccer. Um, lots of really amazing fish. I had never had ceviche before, and that's basically all we ate every day in the field. We'd make it ourselves, catch the fish, cut them up in extremely sanitary conditions, and then eat, <laughs> eat it. So we had a, you know, many, many pounds of limes with us. If you don't know what ceviche is, it's basically fish that is cooked, quote unquote, in lime juice. So the lime juice denatures the proteins, and it turns white, but it's cold and delicious you've never tried it. This is a little maybe bonier than you might get here in Colorado. But really, really amazing seafood. It's really an incredible place. Lots of really generous people cooked me very delicious meals. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the science, we would also attach depth loggers to the birds. So we knew how deep they were diving to see if there were differences in how deep blue-footed boobies were going to forage than Peruvian boobies. And then this individual also has that GPS tracker. And I'll show you some GPS tracks in a minute. Um, and when you go back to get, yeah, where's the one you need to catch? Can you see it? It's right here. Yeah, so I got really good at finding pink dots um, in a sea of white and black. Yeah, pretty amazing place to work. Um, and then this is, yeah, it's taking a blood sample from a, a blue-footed booby, just a small prick, and then you release them. And as I said, I was a naive traveler when I went here. And uh, this guy did a, did a lot to keep me sane, actually. So this is Nieto. He was the guard on the island I lived 
on the longest, and he had a love of mangoes. And if you've never had mangoes in South America, you're really missing out because what we get here is a pale, pale in comparison. I was there during mango season and he would barter again with the fishermen. They would bring him mangoes, then they could play soccer. The first day, this knife also, he used it for everything, whether it was cutting up a moray eel or peeling a mango. So he would give me that knife and a full mango that was not peeled and I would butcher it, really. I'm not good at peeling anything with knives. So he saw that happen for a couple of days and then... Peel it right from underneath your teeth. Oh, yeah. Um, He'd do that for, he gave me, you know, two or three days where he let me try myself. And then after that, he would just bring me a mango fully peeled except for where I could hold it. And so I knew at the end of every crazy weird day, which was also really interesting, I'd always have a fresh mango, which did a lot to keep this individual sane because I only brought one book. I read it seven times. It was, it was not a literary masterpiece at all. I won't say what it was, but certainly there were dragons. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's basically a children's book. Um, you know, and every day I would sweep the ticks away from around my bed because I, there was a line of permethrin that I kept quite fresh right here to keep the ticks off me while I was sleeping. So it was a really cool experience, and it led me to think a lot about um, Guano Island ecology and economy, and so I want to just share some of that with you as well. So again, guano, excrement of seabirds and bats, used as fertilizer and also for gunpowder production. Um, the reason that it's all there is really because of the Humboldt Current. So the Humboldt Current is the richest marine ecosystem in the world. I think a lot of us think of the California Current um, when we think of rich aquatic ecosystems, but the Humboldt Current is by far much, much more nutrient rich. This quotation, when you see no more trees, it is Peru, is from a book I really love that I read after I was there, which recounts this individual's journey from Central America down to Chile. And as soon as you get here, there are no more trees on the coast. The reason for that is that the Humboldt Current is this really cold um, water coming up from Antarctica that hits a sharp coastal shelf and causes upwelling all along the coast. This cold water upwelling shuts down any kind of rain. And so you have the driest desert in the world all along this coast, including the Atacama, which is here in Northern Peru. And so there are no more trees. It's really crazy. As soon as you hit the coast, the, the border between Ecuador and Peru, there really are no trees from here all the way until you get down into the South American temperate rainforests. So it's this zone of oceanic upwelling. It's pretty narrow, only 260 kilometers across. It originates in the Southern Pacific. It's cold, low salinity, high productivity. So the highest concentrations of chlorophyll in any ocean in, in the entire world. Um, it's the richest marine ecosystem in the world. So if you think of the California current, the carbon levels here, which is a measure of productivity, are 10 times higher than the California current. And so it sets up this really juxtaposed coast. So this is the, the road I was telling you about, sand to the ocean, sand as high as you can see. You only really see vegetation in areas where rivers come out of the Andes. And this is the annual average precipitation for Lima, Peru. This is in millimeters. So the most they get is 1.2 millimeters, and it's mostly fog. So it almost never rains there. With climate change, um, they're getting a lot more rain events, which is actually really damaging to these kinds of habitats. It's the same as when we get heavy rain after a forest fire. Uh, you get tons of flooding and flash floods and so on. So you know, very little going on in the land with respect to wildlife or vegetation, but the ocean is just incredibly rich. So it sports tens of millions of birds, the most marine mammal, like the largest marine mammal populations in the world, including, including the most cetaceans and lots of other uh, food sources for humans and other things like fish, moray eels, and then does anyone know what these are? Rotten peppers. Rotten peppers. It's actually a distant relative of ours. Not, so not, a, not vegetation, but an animal. Almost, yeah, you're getting close. You're getting close. So these are uh, sea squirts or tunicates. So as larvae, these have a notochord, which we also have, um, but they lose it as adults. So they're actually one of the more primitive vertebrates that exists. They live in the ocean, they filter feed, they're harvested, and they don't taste very good at all. Um, they have they almost no substance. So if they're in the spoon that you're blowing on, they'll fly out of it like paper, but they have a really strong, bad flavor. So I encourage you to try them, but they're, you know, Maybe you have to get used to it. And so there's so much food there that you get to see things like this. So this is a foraging flock of blue-footed and Peruvian boobies. And each of these is an individual entering the water. 
So these are plunge diving birds. Once they're underwater, they swim around. This went on for six and a half hours. This foraging flock moved up and down this part of the island for six and a half hours foraging on sardines and anchovies. So I really can't overstress how much life there is there in the ocean. Sorry, in the ocean, not on the land. But yeah, the land, super depopulative life unless you're by the coast. And then you get some endemics like these gray-headed gulls or other things that migrate north like rural terns. So historically, the coast was known for its coastal riches with respect to the food it provided, but also with respect to the guano that was used for growing things. You can mix this guano with sand and grow corn. It's amazing. Um, but contemporarily, it's really changed to a fish meal industry, um, which is unfortunate for the birds and marine mammals, but still is important for the economy of Peru. Um, so guano itself is a source of nitrogen, like I said. In most places, well, everywhere that you have rain, nitrogen is e easily leached. So if there's lots of water, nitrogen is the first to leave. Because these islands don't receive rain, sometimes for as long as 100 years, the nitrogen stays in the guano. And so it's a really, really good source of nitrogen for things like um, fertilizer or gunpowder. And in the beginning, when these islands were first discovered by the Western world, there were hundreds of years of accumulated guano. So meters and meters of this stuff that could be harvested and that was still really rich in nitrogen. Interestingly, one of the islands I read about, they're like, there's one plant on this island that grows beside the water cistern. Um, and it had been planted there from somewhere else and it actually died the year before I visited that island. <laughs> so plants really don't grow here because there's really no water. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's this excellent fertilizer and nitrogen source uh, for gunpowder production. So a little bit about the islands, like I said, they're really, really short food chains. So the food chains here in the mountains are complex. You have large carnivores, you have small carnivores, herbivores, and so on. On these islands, you really just have birds, decomposers, and ectoparasites. So um, basically, when you look at the islands, you see the predominant vertebrate are seabirds, whether they're boobies, cormorants, or pelicans. There are also some marine mammals. But feeding on all of these concentrations of birds when they die, which a lot of them do. Seabird colonies are full of dead organisms. Uh, they get eaten by decomposers. And then uh, when they're alive, they're fed on by things like ticks and hippobosid flies, which are these flat flies that live under their feathers. And so um, interestingly, uh, one of the things you notice, and you've probably seen in the images, is that even when the birds are nesting, you know, there's not tons of birds in this picture. Well, there are. but you know, not as many as there could have been, they still nest in these really dense aggregations. Part of that is probably because of um, the necessity of crowding. So these islands were so crowded with birds during the evolutionary history of the islands that they tend to nest in dense aggregations. Those also help with predator avoidance. So historically, there were condors in all of these islands, which would eat them and their chicks. Those were all killed, which we'll talk about. Um, but crowding is probably the biggest thing a lot of people notice. So these are the densest seabird colonies in the world. Uh, these are guanine cormorants. And like I mentioned earlier, they nest three to four birds per meter squared, which is pretty amazing. Um, and because of this crowding, it seems like a lot of birds on these islands do things that are weird. So there's burrow nesting terns on these islands. Terns don't nest in burrows anywhere else. But terns are little, and so you can imagine that in dense colonies of pelicans and cormorants and boobies, they might have been pushed to the periphery and then evolved this other mechanism for, for nesting. So they really, really are dense colonies. This is a typical Peruvian booby colony. Um, and these are the Inca terns I was mentioning, so really beautiful black terns with colorful feathers that nest in burrows. And there's also penguins there that nest in burrows, Magellanic penguins, or sorry, Humboldt penguins in this region. Here's what I was talking about with respect to the ticks. You can see one on my sock right here. But you can also see that there are a lot of other ones. <laughs> um, so these are our gassed ticks. They can reach high enough numbers in crowded colonies to cause whole colony abandonment. This is a chick, and you can see all of the bites on its feet. The most common sound in the colonies, other than grunting and whistling, is actually the pitter-patter of chick feet trying to get the ticks off. Um, and they can exsanguinate and die from loss of blood from these ticks. So really, they have a huge impact on these colonies and often cause the birds to, to abandon. Um, in terms of the food chain, you have these birds that get fed on by ticks, and also when they die, eaten by beetles. Those are in turn fed upon by native scorpions and spiders that live there. There's one species of spider that 
The first thing that tells you you got bit by it is that your eyes start to bleed. <laughs> I didn't know those were on the island when I was there, but pretty interesting spiders. And then they did introduce lizards to some of the islands to control the ticks, but a really short food chain that is super reliant on the ocean and all the food the ocean provides. Yeah, the ticks are native. They're part of the yeah part of the ecology of the islands. Okay, so then focusing just for the last little couple minutes on the guano era, it was this amazing time of prosperity and stability for the for the country of Peru and for the region in general. Um, the guano islands themselves, there's about 120 of them along this region, highlighted in brown. The farthest from the coast is the one I lived on, Lobos de Afuera, so about 86 kilometers. So they're pretty accessible from the coast. You can go to them and collect the guano. Um, they're difficult to access once you get to them, and you've seen how we get onto them, and, and the boats have an easier time with those large um, docks that have been constructed. They generally lack vegetation. There's no rain, which I think is the next point, and so, um, oh, mammalian, yeah. Well, anyways, there's no rain there. The guano is really high quality, and there's m no mammalian predators naturally on the islands to bother the birds, and so they can be there nesting and producing a lot of guano. There are rats and cats on some of them now. And there's a gradient in guano quality. So the guano up here is better than the guano farther south because these islands receive more rain. So um, the guano birds are the three most important producers of guano are the Peruvian pelican, the guanai cormorant, and the Peruvian uh, booby. In order of importance, historically, probably pelicans, then cormorants, then boobies. But contemporarily, uh, these are more numerous, the cormorants. Um, this is the Peruvian pelican, a very handsome looking pelican. They are considered their own species as of 2012. This is the guanai cormorant, recognizable as a cormorant probably to everyone in the room, but an endemic also to the Humboldt current. And then this image of the Peruvian booby we've already seen. So these three species are the ones that are important guano producers. And you can see that they do nest close together. So here's Peruvian booby nesting. These are guanai cormorants starting to form a colony. And then these are pelicans. These ones have built their nests. These ones are getting ready to. And you can imagine, again, thinking back to when these islands were fully populated, there'd be no space to walk on these islands. It would have all been nesting birds. So in terms of a guano timeline, guano was important to the Inca. There was small-scale extraction from the islands that they could access from the coasts for a very long time. And they rigorously protected the islands and the birds because the guano was so important for fertilizer. Um, the guano age happened in the mid to late 1800s. Guano was discovered by the Western world and extraction happened at scales that were previously unknown. So that's when the hundreds of years of accumulated deposits were basically scraped off of every island. They didn't pay attention to whether the birds were nesting. Um, and so it was really damaging for the bird populations and they didn't rotate across any of the islands. But Basically, they exported almost 13 million tons of guano worth around $13 billion, and the deposits were exhausted by about 1880. So then followed the War of the Pacific in the aftermath, so the guano industry lost importance at that point. But then, really, really interestingly, there's this thing called the Second Guano Age, so from the early to mid-1900s. And the Second Guano Age is the first example of managing a wild population for a renewable resource successfully in the history of any human population that we know of. So scientists implemented this guano bird conservation program. So they started rotating which islands were being harvested. They started timing guano harvest so that they wouldn't be harvesting during breeding season. They removed predators. So all of those condors I mentioned used to live there. They got killed. Um, they also introduced those lizards for ectoparasite control. And by the mid 1950s, there were about 40 million adult birds present along the coast, which is actually higher than it ever existed. So um, this all produced a record of 332,000 metric tons of fresh guano in 1956. So they actually effectively managed the resource and started exporting again. Unfortunately, this really expanded bird population. They also um, blocked off regions of the coast and killed predators, and the birds started nesting on the mainland, which is crazy. Again, indicating the birds' population size was limited by nesting sites and not by food, which is like unheard of in terms of most ecosystems. But anyways, an, uh, after the second guano age, there was a huge, strong El Nino, which causes warm water to come in. Um, a lot of the birds, these inflated bird populations died. There was an economic crisis. And then Haber discovered the Haber-Bosch process, where we could then produce our own ammonia. And natural sources of nitrogen, like guano, became much less important. 
From then until today, we call it the fish meal age. So basically there's been more or less unrestricted industrial development and exports encouraged a fish meal that are used to feed um, both livestock and pets. Actually the pet food industry is huge in this and guano bird populations have crashed to kind of their present day levels. It's not all a sad story though. The guano islands received official protection a few years after I was there. So they're all protected and there's regions around them in the ocean that are protected. But the level of fishing that's going there, going on there right now is pretty unsustainable. So really interesting islands. I don't think being a guano harvester was easy. Well, I know it wasn't. Um, like I said, they are mostly indentured servants. Um, a lot of them died on the islands. They're really harsh conditions to work in. Um, you know, full sun, lots of wind, very little water. Breathing in guano probably isn't good for you and so on. Um, so very, very hard work and I have a lot of respect for the people that could actually do this because I definitely couldn't. Um, but a really interesting history to these islands that I was focused on the ecology of but played such an important role economically in this country. So I did a lot of thinking when I was there and I did a lot of writing when I got back. So we found that the birds from different islands forage in different places and depending on the bird species, they actually forage in different locations which is interesting. So this is the data we collected from our GPS trackers from each island showing where the birds are going on each foraging trip. Um, we found that you can tell a male and female Peruvian booby by the way they sound. Not really a breakthrough paper, but you know, it's good to start publishing early. Um, I found that they do hybridize. So here's a hybrid individual. Interestingly, the eye color is what you would expect for blue or for um, red plus yellow and you get a mixed up foot as well. You also get intermediate feather shape. Um, and it does lead to gene flow between the two species. So they do hybridize and um, it's not as uncommon as we thought it might be. And we also found that although we find in so individuals, all that you need to know here is that if it's black, you're a blue-footed booby. If it's gray, you're a Peruvian booby genetically. So we know some individuals are hybrids, but there are other examples. So there's actually genes that being exchanged between blue-footed and Peruvian boobies which could have important implications evolutionarily. And we also found that birds that are living on these upwelling systems, so you can see chlorophyll here, sort of in red, birds that live on these upwelling systems are much less sight faithful than other seabirds. So closely related brown boobies, you can tell what colony they're from based on their genome very easily. With Peruvian and blue-footed boobies and also Peruvian pelicans, you can't tell where they're from because they're moving large distances, I think because these upwellings that they rely on fail from time to time. And if you just stayed where you were, you wouldn't have very successful reproduction. So they move around a lot and that causes a lot of gene flow across the range of the blue-footed booby and the Peruvian booby. So, you know, it was a weird place to be, but also an incredibly beautiful place to be and an important one for my development as a scientist. Every night looked like this, some of the most beautiful sunsets in the world. So even though I was surrounded by ticks and worried about my health and wondering when I would get home, it was an amazing experience that set me up um, pretty well for my career as a scientist. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I can take any questions. So we have obviously time for questions, and this microphone is for the grassroots, not for making your voice louder. So if you have a question, let me bring you the microphone. Well, I have, I have a, question a question to start. To start. <laughs> um, so can you talk about the Peruvian governments? What, they want to protect the islands. Like, we have national parks, and we have all this public land, and we have this commitment to protecting natural species. Talk, talk about what they do in Peru. Yeah, so there are, there's a national park system in Peru as well. The islands aren't a national park uh, system that can be accessed by the public. So basically the islands are being protected for the historical importance of the guano industry and the continuing importance. They actually still harvest guano. Um, and there are a few that are close enough to shore that they'll take visitors to. So you can see the guano birds, you can see Peruvian boobies and Peruvian pelicans and so on. Um, but I think the government of Peru is becoming more and more conservation minded. So the decision to generate, to create like this guano island protected area happened relatively recently, but um, it, it includes exclusion regions around the islands, although we know the birds travel farther than those regions, and so whether or not that's enough protection is hard to know. Um, they're heavily impacted by El Nino events, which are increasing in frequency and intensity, so it's hard to know um, what might happen to populations going forward, but it's nice at least that their nesting areas are protected. And the one thing I should say about the genetic structure of these populations, given that they're not really different from 
the farthest north guano island to the farthest south with respect to Peruvian boobies. If there are population crashes, it doesn't seem like it'll lead to genetic diversity loss, which is really important and different than some other seabirds. But I do think that the Peruvian government is thinking more critically about protecting some of their natural resources, yeah. Is there any consideration about reintroducing a predator right out of there. Yeah, so um, the question is, is there any consideration of, I guess, reintroducing condors? That was really the only native predator out there. So there are a couple other avian predators. There are kelp gulls that um, are quick to snap up a young booby. Um, there are also turkey vultures that live on the islands, and they'll prey on chicks if they can get them. I think that the hope is that condors will eventually recolonize the islands naturally, but it hasn't happened, and I guess it's been a while now, you know, less than 100 years, but you'd think a condor would get out there. I don't know of any, any um, talk of doing that, though. Because the guano is still harvested, the birds are still really protected, and I don't think, I think it would be hard to convince them to introduce condors to the islands again. Yeah, because there still is a guard on every island who makes sure humans don't get out there and mess with the birds. And actually, the guards are also responsible for killing cats and rats, which have introduced, been introduced to some of the islands. Uh, the Atacama, Atacama Desert stretches from uh, southern Peru to uh, northern Chile, and you were in northern Peru, uh, and the pictures you took looked a whole lot like the Atacama. Uh, what's the difference? So the Ata oh, is this on? There. Um, the Atacama, like you said, is it's between southern Peru and northern Chile. Uh, it's a little bit higher elevation, sort of, than where I was. I was in mostly the Sichuan Desert, which is the name of the desert in northern coastal Peru. Um, in terms of differences, there are some species that you find where I was that you don't find in the Atacama, because it's even drier and even harsher. Um, and certainly, there are very few rivers that come down out of the Andes in the Atacama, and so the river ecosystems I was showing you are a big difference between the Sichuan Desert and the Atacama. Uh, what university were you connected with when you took the trip? And uh, what was my other question? <laughs> well, you, you can think about your other question while I answer that one. So I was a PhD student at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. So very, very far away from South America. But my lab that I was in works on seabirds, predominantly in seabird speciation and hybridization. And so we were working on blue-footed and Peruvian boobies at the same time that we were working also on um, all of the other booby species in the tropics, and then a bunch of other seabirds, but in Ontario, Canada, right on the shore of, of Lake Ontario. How does this kind of research um, uh, relate to the University of Colorado? Of yeah, that's places? a good question. So um, now at the University of Colorado, I predominantly study local birds. So I work on rosy finches. Um, I work on red pole finches, which we only really get in the winter but we mostly work on chickadees. So a lot of the questions I was asking in boobies about hybridization and speciation um, translate well to chickadees because chickadee species also hybridize. We have hybrids between mountain and black-capped out here in the west. And I've done a lot of work on black-capped and Carolina chickadees in the east. And the nice thing, I mean, it's nice to go to these remote islands and work on birds that we don't know a lot about, but it's also nice to work on chickadees because there's years and years of ecological data and behavioral data that we can use to inform our studies of speciation and hybridization. So we mostly work on local species now, but we're thinking about getting back down into South America to do some more conservation genetics work. I never use these. Okay, um, is there a difference in quality in guano depending on how long it's been sitting there? And also, talking about chickadees, I didn't know mountain and black cap would hybridize, and what would it look like? Those are very, yeah, oh, turn on. Um, okay, so the only way that nitrogen will leach from guano is if there's a rain event. So if the old guano was rained on or experienced a lot of moisture, then you'd expect it to be lower in nitrogen content than newer guano. 
But if the guano is on one of those northern islands that don't receive rain even every 100 years, then the quality of old guano is just as good as the quality of new guano, because what you want is nitrogen. So as long as the nitrogen is not being leached out, they can be equivalent. So those historical deposits of you know, meters and meters and meters of guano, even the guano at the bottom was still a good nitrogen source. Then with respect to chickadees, so black-capped and Carolina chickadees hybridize regularly. They look almost identical. They're very hard to tell apart. Black-capped and mountain chickadees, they don't hybridize that regularly. It seems like they hybridize in regions that we've disturbed, either through logging or building cities. And actually, the Front Range is a place where we regularly get hybrids reported. And a hybrid sort of, the problem is we haven't quantified supercilium variation very well. So mountain chickadees have that white eyebrow. But there's a lot of variation within mountain chickadees about what that looks like. But people will say if it's a broken supercilium, and the mountain chickadee has buffy sides, which typically they're gray, then it's probably a hybrid. Um, we're looking at using whole genome sequences to identify hybrids across the entire co-occurring range of black captain mountain chickadees. And my grad student right now is working at the Mountain Research Station, which is the station associated with the University of Colorado Boulder, to understand what causes them to hybridize. Because they don't usually, and they're broadly co-occurring. But something we do to the habitat, we think changes dominance interactions, which are really important for chickadees when they're evaluating mate quality, to the point where female mountain chickadees will choose to extra pair mate with male black cap chickadees. So we're going to actually do some in the field manipulations of food and nesting resources, as well as plumage, to see if we can cause hybridization to happen and really understand what it is about these altered environments is causing a breakdown in species barriers. But I'll have an answer to that in three to six years. <laughs> I'll invite you back in three to six years.